Well, it has been a bad few months for American media. Perhaps no one knows that better than CBS News anchor Scott Pelley. In a speech he delivered at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, Pelley admitted to the role that he played in the race to be first, uh, the first news organization to report a breaking news story. He also admitted that many times he has gotten it wrong. Listen. During our coverage of Newtown, I sat on my set and I reported that Nancy Lanza was a teacher at the school and that her son had attacked her classroom. It's a hell of a story, but it was dead wrong. From the Newtown shooting to the Boston bombing, time and again the media has chosen speed over accuracy. And time and again their reports have missed the mark. It's a problem Scott Pelley attributed to overzealous media wanting to get the scoop first. How does it serve the public if we're first? You know what first is all about? It's vanity. It's self-conceit. We do it to make ourselves feel better. No one's sitting at home watching five television monitors going, oh, they were first. That's a game that we play in our control rooms. Nobody does that. So is the state of the media really as bleak as it sounds? To discuss this, Christopher Chambers joins me now. He's a journalism professor at Georgetown University. How are you doing? Thanks for joining me, Chris. Um, so did this speech really reveal anything that people didn't already know about the media? Well, I thought it, it revealed a lot about Scott Pelley basically doing a mea culpa for everybody. Um, and I, I commend him for that. But, you know, as with all mea culpas, it's almost... Uh, a situation where you fall on your own sword, not necessarily to get sympathy, but to kind of deflect the deeper meanings of things. And I think, you know, he scratched the surface when he talked about self-conceit, but where does that self-conceit from the, uh, to the mainstream media, particularly TV, you know, cable giants and the three networks, where does that bubble up from? He didn't drill down to that level. Do you think it's more meaningful to hear this admission from somebody that is a news anchor who's been on that desk saying this incorrect information as it has come out versus a critic that, that is looking from the outside and criticizing the journalism uh, that, that that is today? Well, I think, I think it is meaningful. I mean, particularly if you're talking about CBS, which is a mainstay of broadcast journalism for 60 years, and in a cog in a, in a bigger machine of, of uh, the Viacom universe, which has all kinds of entertainment uh, uh, properties and movie studios and that feed into this monster that has been created. I think it, it, it's good to see this inside view. But at the same time, it does nothing to really give us the basis for what's going on here. I mean, as soon as he gave that speech, you had critics and commentators on the left and on the right saying that, you know, um, we don't trust the media because they don't provide our point of view. They don't provide our boosterism and our, our dome that we live under. You know, so who cares what Scott Pelley says? And, and have proceeded to, to list some of the things that they think Scott Pelley has done to offend them, which has nothing to do with the facts. It has more to do with where they're coming from, you know, that he's not reporting the stories that they want to do to either, you know, screw conservatives or screw President Obama. So, I mean, it's not drilling down to the case of, you know, corporate control, corporate concentration, closing foreign bureaus, the money uh, that is, you know, the, 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 the stakeholders are trying to strip out of news gathering. So they lay off people. They lay off people with experience. Um, they don't drill down again into deeper stories. And as we know now, uh, versus in 1983, it is six uh, corporations that actually control 90% of the media these days. Basically. But what does he have to, to gain from something that you call a mea culpa? What could he possibly gain from this speech? Well, you, you, gain, you gain credibility. He already had authority. Now you, grant, you gain credibility among the regular consumers of news across, even across all platforms. Um, not practitioners, but, but consumers. And that's what's important. He gains an audience. He gets one step closer to that, you know, to Uncle Walter Cronkite or Edward R. Murrow, who, you know, who, who practiced this really downstream. He's practicing it upstream because the mainstream media is already down here. So he has to climb up. So he attains that, that, that credibility and that aura that he is the heir apparent to 
CBS giants, and it is CBS like Morrow and like Cronkite. And, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm not trying to be cynical in terms of his motivations, but I think that it, it, it operates in that direction, and I think that's good for him on all counts. And, Chris, we've had you on here multiple times talking about uh, the way that mainstream media is going these days. You're a journalism professor. We are in an unprecedented age where there's Twitter and Facebook and anything that you could possibly think of. We are in an age of the overabundance of information. Right. So how can these news organizations change their ways to both be credible and accurate, but also to compete in a 21st century where the information comes from every angle possible? Well, I think that, that you have to go back to the old school things that he talked about, about editing, about you know checking sources and checking facts, and also about looking at your own you know your own place in the universe. About what's your point of view? Is that you're not pandering and feeding raw meat to people for that sake to get eyeballs on your on the screen to get clicks on the site. I mean, there has to be some higher calling here, and we do not see it. And you see these stories anywhere from the the uh, the Ariel Castro story in Cleveland to you know everything having to do with Benghazi and whether it has legs or not. Not, no legs, depending on who you are. I mean, not the facts, but where you're coming from politically, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to have these checks and balances in, and that takes that takes guts and money, and we, we've run out of that. But at the same time, do you think that anyone is actually paying attention to anything that Scott Pelley or anyone else says? Because actually, no one really broadcast what he said. No one really wants to admit that really dark, <laughs> seedy the truth that is well, the media. You just you just hit the punchline. I mean, nobody's. I mean, you know, I it, it, we. We have people, say, under 25 that probably don't even know who Scott Pelley is. They don't watch 60 Minutes or the CBS Evening News. They get their, 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 their stuff off Twitter. But where does that original reporting come from that feeds into social media? It comes from the legacy properties like CBS, like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, whether we like it or not, or whether the younger generation likes it or not. The source has to come from somewhere. And maybe, you know, he needs to do a better job of reaching out, and maybe we all need a better job. Of, of educating, and I think this was a first step for him, talking to these students. Well, hopefully a few of those...